Okay, we'll go ahead and call to order this December the 18th, 2019 meeting of the Franklin County Commission. Roll call. Commissioner Sotomayor. Present. Commissioner Waymeyer. Present. Chair Howard. Present. Vice Chair Dickinson. <coughs> Present. Commissioner Dunn. Present. If you'd all stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance and please remain standing for the invocation that will be led by Commissioner Dickinson. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time of year, this special time of year where we celebrate um, the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, who grew up to be our savior and king. Um, we thank you for the uh, snowfall that came and, and reminded us of the winter time of year. Just help us to be good stewards of all things as your word teaches us to be in our time, in our talents, in our money. Help us to be good stewards uh, as we make the decisions of the county. Amen. Thanks, sir. Okay. Anything corresponding organizational? No, sir. Anyone signed up for public comment? A citizen designed to speak on an item not on the agenda may do so at this time. The discussion is limited to five minutes and the commission will not take action or discuss items at this time. The discussion should be limited to matters of county commission business and public comment <coughs> is not permitted in regard to personnel matters or on pending legal matters. Items introduced under public comment may become agenda items at a later date. Norman Woogie. A couple of instances have happened recently in Franklin County. <clears throat> Several of departments working together, you might say, saved the day for me and my kids. Starting with the latest, the volunteer fire department came out and put a fire out in my combine. The Sheriff's Department was there first. The Fire Department <clears throat> uh, Chief is the son of the late Laura Huston, uh, Sutton, the county clerk, when I first started going to meetings many years ago. The Combine Fire <clears throat> was professionally put in it, professionally put out, saving the bean field and most of the Combine. Jason Wilcutt of the fire group volunteered to Combine the rest of my beans. He and his son, Dakota, actually worked for me to get the combine home. The other uh, county departments and ambulance departments saved my wife's life in an accident at our home, doing special things in their training and beyond. Of course, my oldest son <clears throat> had a widow make her heart attack, 3% survival rate. The ambulance crew in a local hospital worked diligently and professionally and saved his life. Our family, <clears throat> all are thankful to all of you, David's kids, adopted kids, foster kids, and his own kids are blessed to have David saved. Our whole family are so grateful to all that work together. Storm. Yeah, no one else is Alan uh, supposed to be here today? He's in the parking lot on the phone. Okay. All right. That's all on public comment. He takes his consent agenda. <laughs> Items today that are on the consent agenda need considered and approved are the commission meeting minutes from December the 11th, 2019, study session minutes from December the 9th, 2019, claim vouchers in the amount of $1,445,528.69 and tax change orders in the amount of a minus $915.06. Look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve. So the motions are second. Second. Mr. Saldemeyer? Yes. Commissioner Waymeyer? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. 
Okay, it takes us to item of business. The first item of business today is to consider and approve an engineering firm for the district court HVAC project. Brandon? Morning. So we uh, sent out an RFQ uh, last month to uh, get some engineering firms that may be interested in designing the uh, new HVAC system for the district court. Um, got uh, four responses back from that. Um, we got uh, one from uh, Latimer Summers um, and Associates. They actually uh, designed the system that's in the courthouse right now. Um, BG Consultants, Ross and Berezini, and PKMR Engineering um, <clears throat> were the ones we heard back from. Um, I'm looking through the uh, information packets that they sent to me. Um, all of them are qualified and I think would do a great job. Uh, I'm leaning more toward my, my personal thoughts or toward uh, uh, Latimer Summers. Part of that is because we've worked with them in the past. And um, uh, when we looked into uh, replacing the uh, HVAC system in the district court um, a few years ago, um, I guess we had decided on Latimer Summers. They've already walked through the building and they've uh, uh, put together a, a plan of um, what they would like to have in the building, or at least at that time, what was decided on. Um, I think we may want to go a different route from what they originally came up with, but they've already done a lot of the groundwork um, for getting that stuff designed. So um, I feel like they would be a good choice to go with, but looking for any questions or concerns that you all may have with doing that and kind of your blessing on moving forward with them. Brandon, when you say they designed the system in the courthouse, you're talking about the historic courthouse. Correct, yes, yeah. And what's your experience been with that system? So, um, as you all know, we had some old issues in a few years ago with that building. Um, those were uh, largely due to uh, mechanical um, issues that we had with the installation of the equipment. Um, there was also some uh, uh, kind of some user error on the um, control side of it. And the graphics that we have with that are a little bit confusing, um, but we got all that stuff straightened out and we haven't had any issues since and it's working great for us. I think the primary issue that we had, and this was before Brandon was my maintenance director, but we, I think there was legit confusion on the part of our maintenance director on how to properly operate the system. And so we did have some issues. There were mechanical issues with the control panel. Uh, since Brandon's been on, we have not had a single one of those issues. We've got good rapport with Latimer Summers. Um, we've learned um, in the process of doing this, and, and David Lee was a great help to us, that you don't really bid these types of things on a cost basis given the nature of the services that are provided. And so that being said, Latimer's familiarity with the district court, given that they've already been there and designed something, I think will undoubtedly save us money because they've already done some of the work before. So I think the rapport is good. I, I do think the price will be the best when it's all said and done. Um, and certainly Brandon's comfortable with them. So I would recommend them as well. I guess that would have been the question I would have had about the, the process with four of them reply whether it was a bid type situation or or not. I guess you answered that. So I can tell you when, the, just from my perspective, when they did do the courthouse, uh, the historic courthouse, and uh, um, helped us with other projects, they've been super attentive. They've been on site a lot. Um, you know, just whatever our questions are, happy to take our phone calls anytime. So really responsive to our needs. So I think that's that's really good. I mean, not that these other companies probably wouldn't, but we have a rapport with, with this company and have done business with them, so. Where are they out of, Brandon? Uh, Topeka. So they're close if we have issues then. Right, right. And I will add that um, the engineer that we've been assigned would be assigned to for the uh, district court um, was the same one that designed the old courthouse system. Um, and he was also a huge help and he, uh, we had 
multiple phone calls with him while we were having this um, issue with the mold and he even came down um, when we were having those issues in the courthouse so he's been uh, easy to get a hold of and right there so that makes me feel a lot better too if we have any issues that he'll be available now they'll, they'll just design the system and then we'll bid it out is that correct so they'll, there's um there's some different options we can go with how involved we want them to be in the whole process they can the main thing is that they'll design the system and say hey this is what we need to have in here and then we can put that out to bid um, they can also come to that bidding process and they can answer questions that the contractors may have uh, specifically on the equipment that'll be going in so that is all going to come before you so they will present design options we will bring set options to you so that you guys can make that decision once you do then of course we will bid it out bring the bids back in select the contractor so you'll these will be decision decisions that all of you will be making we have a, a ballpark number on what the, we're talking about for cost for this for this i was going to say to me when we have four qualified individuals cost does become an issue um, in talking with uh, uh, another firm um, before we put out this RFQ, um, their estimates for their design and some of the the average, I guess, amount that they would be involved in the process was around the twenty thousand dollar range. So, I think perceivably we could be around in that area with uh, with Latimer Summers as well. questions on this if not would look for a motion to approve Latimer Summers as the engineering firm for the district court HVAC project once we do this you'll negotiate hourly rate I mean there'll be some kind of parameters they'll work within yeah yes absolutely we'll sit down with them and then of course if that fails for some reason we can come back and pick another yeah yeah absolutely but give the perception it's an open check we're giving away. No, no. I'd be happy to make that motion. Good. Have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Waymeyer? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Stoudemire? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thanks, Thanks Brandon. <laughs> All right. Uh, item number two the center approved the open burning resolution in Franklin County. Morning. Morning. Uh, as before you, two or three weeks ago in a, a study session discussing this, there was uh, a couple questions that came up. I believe we've addressed those. Uh, we did uh, change some verbiage in the resolution. We're updating a resolution from 12 years ago, uh, brought it up to current, um, changing the permit process a little bit to an online. Uh, permit um, with no fee uh, we did also uh, set up for those people without internet access if they still want to come into planning and zoning they can get a seven-day permit um, it, the permits are for the location of the burn um, that's one of the the uh, things that we don't have currently is we don't know the locations where these burns are uh, um, actively um, occurring um, I did also last week met with all of the fire chiefs for the fire districts and went over the permit system and the changes in the uh, resolution and they all approved of our changes. Um, in our discussion, they also agreed to uh, help get the message out to the citizens and uh, to also help any of them that don't have internet access to fill out the permits online for them so we can get as much of that done as as possible online uh, the fire departments also uh, will have access to the um, dashboard or the map that shows where the permits have been issued those locations I guess Alan one of the big <clears throat> questions also that came up was the brush pile situation and that's been addressed correct yes <clears throat> yes we all know that it's a daily permit but the brush piles will burn for two or three days the only thing that I do ask is if we've got a large uh, 
pasture clearing operation that after four or five days, if uh, whoever's doing that would uh, put in a new permit so that the fire department knows there's still active burning uh, going at that location. Um, again, online, that shouldn't be that big of a deal, but we've got it set to where the seven day permits will be on the map for seven days. A one day permit will be on there for five days. So we'll know um, that a brush pile has been lit in that area and it'll be there for five days. So I believe that's a, addressed the concerns that we had on the brush piles. We also changed some of the language, the way it was uh, written before in the resolution that uh, they had to be in attendance the whole time of the burn. And that's been changed to where uh, if once the area is a person has taken a reasonable um, action to uh, contain that fire, then it's okay for that, like a brush pile, make sure that it can't spread or what a reasonable, per reasonable person would consider so it wouldn't spread. And we all know accidents happened. Happen. I've worked them before to where brush piles have been there for two or three days and the wind comes up and we have an accidental fire. Um, I don't think that's an issue. None of the fire departments had any problems with any of that either. Brandon, uh, actually, they're pretty uh, um, pretty happy with the way we've set things up and the fact that they'll now know uh, when people do the permits that they're going to be where the burns are going to be in their county. Yep. Will the resolution number be on that? Yes. Yeah. Every, every time you want to burn, you got to go get a seven-day permit? Or you can go online and get a permit just for one day. Anytime you want. I'm not thrilled about this, Alan, this seven day deal. I was hoping for something that was really simple, almost like what originally we had, uh, just call it in and on the uh, non-emergency number and tell them where, where you're gonna burn and pay one dollar and get a season long permit. Well, we did away with that several years ago because we were getting too many calls into the dispatch center and then we went to that they were just calling into a recorded line and we have no idea where anybody is burning. I didn't like that either. <laughs> I like the original one where they knew where you were going to burn, you called it in and, and you were done with it. it. Seemed awful simple to me. And I think what they're trying to do is help our rural fire departments that they don't get phone calls and get sent out to a, a legitimate burn, uh, taking time away from work and well, and this, then that's exactly right. And this will also allow us to know who's burning because before we don't have any idea on the current system who's even burning or a contact number for them. There's a reason to have the system, any system, any permitting process, any regulation at all is to uh, manage burning so that it's done safely and the person burning, but more for his neighbors and the rest of the community. And that original system or the system a few years ago didn't didn't do that didn't didn't work very well so that's why we don't do that anymore but. Uh, there is one question that I do have on that seven day permit and in talking with Derek if you want to uh, charge on that for people to come into planning and zoning uh, we need to know what you would like to charge um, I've talked with other department heads and it ranges anywhere from a dollar to ten dollars so we decided to leave that to the Commission to let me know what you want to put if you want to charge anything on that permit. If you do it online, there's no cost? No cost online. And if they come into the planning and zoning office, they'll come in, fill out the same information that's on the daily permit. <coughs> Somebody will enter that information and hand them that permit back with the permit number on it. And it'll automatically assign a permit number to anybody doing a seven day permit. So we'll still know on the uh, What's the seven map. day permit? What's it, what problem did the seven day permit fix? I guess I didn't. No internet access. Oh, okay. So they don't have to go back in every day if they don't have internet. I personally don't like the idea of a charge on that. I feel like they should be penalized because they don't have the internet and, and they want to get a burn permit. Um, I know it'd be a, a little bit of work for the planning commission or planning, um, but I, I myself don't like the idea of a charge for that. I can see it mentally, it'll phase away completely. 
maybe not 100%, but pretty well go away as time goes on, you know. So I'm kind of with Rick. I mean, I understand taking their time, but I hope it, this is just kind of an option we're giving for people until they can get to that point, you know. Other thoughts on that? I, I would agree. I do, you know, when I saw that, I was like, well, if, it, if you can do it online for no cost, then I don't see why you would need to have negligible a negligible amount. It's not like it's yeah. going to generate any revenue. The per point I said, anything is we make can re sure that the online option is more convenient. Would be we can relook at it if it becomes a problem. I don't know how many burner permits normally we go through a year in the Franklin County. You might have an idea, but you could drop the seven day down to three. I mean, that'd get you through any weekend, which would be the main reason for, you know. We did the seven day just because if you have like uh, Thanksgiving weekend, you're covering four days there, which could even go into Monday being a five day time. And then there may be a time that there's a no burn period in there because they still, with that seven day permit, can still call 229-3501 to see if burning is allowed. And then on the one day permit, we're going to uh, have it set to where if they click for the online permit and no burning is allowed, it will say no burning is allowed and they won't be able to get the permit. They showed us that. <clears throat> All right. I guess there's a consensus that no charge on that. Okay, that we, can, we can put that down then. Is there any more questions on this? I just have one question since Nick is here. We had it the old way, Nick. Was that, a, was that a burden on the dispatcher to call in on the non-emergency line and tell them where you're going to burn and when? I can, I can answer that, Commissioner. Um, this, that was under me at that time, and yes, it was. Um, just because with the number of dispatchers that are in there, there were days when we would have over 100 phone calls in there. They're keeping track of a lot of things, and as Alan said, it was tough to track a lot of those things um, in accordance with that as well. But yes, um, during the burn season, it gets that that phone line was very, very busy, and we still had day-to-day -day activities going on. So, um, and the way that it was set up, um, we still were having to dispatch a lot of a lot of uh, resources out to certain certain areas when those kind of calls were coming. When somebody would call in if there was a fire that was there, I think that. What, what Alan is presenting, I think, is going to help eliminate a lot of that and take the burden off of, off of Nick's staff as well. If for I think one of Nick and I, I got it, Nick. Hold on. I think one of Nick and I's focuses since taking over dispatch is to, I mean, it is an emergency communications center. Um, it's not an answering service for the county or for any one department. It is a line that you call when you are facing emergency circumstances and that's required a lot of changes. And frankly, moving forward, it's still gonna require a lot of, uh, I, I think, information being presented to the community because we still get a lot of those calls from people just thinking, well, I, I, I need to know about you know, Chautauqua days, let's call 911 and, and see what they have to say about it. I mean, that's just not, we don't have enough dispatchers in there that we want them spending their time that way because invariably we'll have a dispatcher on the phone, you know, talking about a burn permit and we'll let something slide that was a heart attack or truly so it's not, I mean, that's really been a huge focus for Nick and I is just changing really what it is that that department does. So, and this is part of that. When uh, you call in and you put your, does it, is it, is it computer generated where the fires are or does that have to be put in manually by somebody? Oh, what do you mean? I mean, like, so if I say I'm burning and, and you're supposed to have a map of all the, where all the burns are, does that, is, when you put that address in, is that, does, does it automatically go up there? If you're doing it online, yes. Yes. Yes, you click so on otherwise, that. Otherwise, if, if I called in, somebody would have to get the map and go, oh, yeah, somebody's burning here. And then somebody else gets a phone call, oh, yeah, there's a burn here. But if you do it online, it's all going to be right there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And dispatch will have access to that map also and know where the burns are going when they page out a fire department. 
they can look at that map and let the department know that there is a controlled burn in that area. And that's all the point of it is to let these fire departments know we're, we're sending a, well, one of my concerns is we're sending a lot of equipment on an emergency basis to these calls that end up being nothing. It's just because somebody drove down the road and saw smoke. Uh, and we'll still, the fire departments will still respond on those calls, but they'll respond non-emergent and they'll only take one piece of equipment and not hurry as much as they are now. I think bottom line is we're not trying to hurt farmers that are legi legi legitimately trying to take care of what they need to do, but what we're trying to do is make sure that people that don't care whether it's a non-burn day if there's too much wind that they go ahead and burn or they start a fire and then they go back to their house. Um, those are the kind of situations what we're trying to prevent uh, and make sure that don't happen. This uh, thousand foot requirement, that, that could be quite burdensome. All of that's done in the open burning, that's a state regulation. We haven't state changed regulation. anything on the state open burning regulations and all that's on the county website also for people to refer to. Like some people are going to have to hunt up a heck of a lot of people to tell them they're going to burn. <laughs> and really that language, Roy, hasn't changed since we started the permit 20 years ago. And I think that's some of the concern that I have is we've got nine, we've pulled out the nine major uh, conditions of the permit that are in the open burning regulation and people are not reading them. Anything else for how long this? Dot would look for a motion to approve resolution number 1942, the open burning resolution, for Franklin County. Motion to approve. Second. And a second. Commissioner Dickinson? Yeah. Commissioner Dunn? Uh, yes, I guess. Commissioner Stoudemire? Yeah. Commissioner Waymeyer? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Thank you. I do appreciate the fact that there was a lot of questions and, and as I was reading through it, I felt that they were answered. So thank you very much for your work. I appreciate that also. Thank you. Okay. Item uh, number three, consider and approve the year end transfers. Commissioners, as you know, we do this annually um, at our last meeting of the month, uh, last meeting of the year, sorry. Um, and we put in the amounts that we've budgeted for. We do review these amounts. Um, prior to bringing you this resolution and then we review these again um, at the time that we actually do the transfers which will be like about um, the 30th is generally the day that we do those so um, Jody and I will review these again before we actually do the transfers to make sure no additional expenditures have came up in these um, these are all that were the ones that were budgeted, so n nothing additional has been put in there. There are a few on there that we haven't included in the past, but after speaking to our auditor, um, just for transparency's sake, we've added them in there. Um, the tourism um, items that you guys approve in our budget um, for the transfer to Fair Building, Fair Premium, and to Historical Society um, have been included this year. Um, and like I said, we have reviewed all of these in advance to make sure that um, that they are what you budgeted and also that there are going to be funds available for those. Yeah, we need the motion just on this now or is this with five on this? this yes, you, we'll need a, a motion to approve the resolution. And then, <coughs> um, again, we'll review these again and we won't go any higher than this. The only changes that we would potentially make is if um, it's a lower amount, um, if, if there's been some additional expenditures out of each of any of these accounts, but I don't foresee that happening. Talk about it all the time and, and we're gonna have an audit here in a couple months and it'll show it too, but those first two transfers there uh, the general fund equipment reserve and capital improvement when we started this three years ago I mean our capital improvement fund the balance of it was like three four hundred thousand now we're transferring that much in there every single year 
And the only thing that's going to keep our 20 transfer from being significantly more than that is if we take on certain projects like the district courthouse. So um, that's the product of every one of our department heads and elected officials working together to realize these savings. So, and it's these types of transfers that are going to keep us from going into further debt and that will ultimately help us get out of debt. So super thrilled with really all of these numbers, but especially those top two, because those are kind of our bread and butter reserve funds. So. Questions on this? Not would look for a motion to approve the year end transfers. Moved. Second. Motion is second. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Sotomayor? Yes. Commissioner Waymeyer? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay, item number four consider holding a budget hearing to amend the 2019 Franklin County budget. Commissioners, as you'll remember, um, two weeks ago, we did do a budget amendment. Um, we usually try to do that all at once, um, but after we were reviewing the transfer resolution, we thought we were going to have to make a, an adjustment to our bond and interest fund um, to, to cover a potential shortfall in there. Um, we do distributions at the very end of the year, December 15th, so sometimes it looks like some of our funds might come in short and then they don't actually um, but we have to plan in advance for that so after we were reviewing the transfers resolution um, we found out there was um, a, a a slight increase in a fee that was charged um, to our bond and interest account that we did not anticipate in the budget process and we were going to be about a thousand dollars over budget in that fund for the year so we needed to do a an, an additional amendment to make an adjustment for that um, and in reviewing that, um, we have in the past couple of years been over in our hospital sales tax fund, as you know, and for the public, that's funds that um, come in off of sales tax. That's not um, budgeted funds. So we don't always have um, a, a good idea of how much money is going to come in there. So as a precautionary measure, we went ahead and put that on here also to increase the sales tax so that we could be sure to give the hospital every um, bit of sales tax that comes in off of that. I don't anticipate this is going to be over at this time, but again, just as a precautionary method. So, so we need to open a budget hearing, um, ask for questions, close the budget hearing, and then approve the amendment. Listen, before we do this, this okay, if not, we look for a motion to open a public budget hearing in the 2019 Franklin County budget. Motion to approve. I have a motion to a second. Second. Motion to a second. Commissioner Sotomayor? Yes. Commissioner Raymeyer? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay, the public budget hearing is now open. Is there anyone out there that would like to make any comments or ask any questions about this amended budget? All come up at once. <laughs> I ask for the second time. Is anyone out there like to speak on this? It doesn't appear we have anyone that wants to speak on this, so we'll look for a motion to close the public budget hearing. Make a motion to that effect. Have a motion or a second? Second. Commissioner Waymeyer? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Sotomayor? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay. Does any of the commission have any questions or anything on this before we? For a motion okay if not would look for a motion to approve the amended budget as presented for 2019 second motion and second commissioner dunn yes commissioner sotomayor yes commissioner waymeyer yes commissioner dickinson yes. chair howard yes okay it takes us to item number five Consider for approval entering to agreement for economic development services with the FCDC for the 2020 calendar year. Derek? Yeah, you may recall that back in July, um, the then president, I guess he's still a president, Josh Walker came in here on behalf of FCDC requesting funding for the 2020 year. Um, at that time, um, the board pledged $64,375 to FCDC. That's the same amount 
that we are giving them this year, and I, I'm not sure when the amount has changed, but it's stayed pretty flat for a long time now. Um, this, of course, the agreement is the formal mechanism by which effectively those funds <coughs> are delivered. Um, so we're just asking that uh, you execute that today. Paul is here ready to answer any questions that you may have. I will tell you, and you know this, Rick, because you're on the board, but the FCDC budget's in pretty good shape right now. A lot of that is because they've went without a director for so long. Um, and so they have accumulated some funds, which given where we're at with Proximity Park is an excellent thing because we know we're going to have to market that. We want to market that because it's a $30 million investment. So we're, we're not in a bad spot there. Paul, to his credit, has really dug into the budget with a level of scrutiny that I haven't seen since I've been working with FCDC. So I think he has good ideas on ways that FCDC can save money, can put money they're spending to a more efficient use. So um, he's here, you wanna to talk to him about it, but this is something we do every year. So and Paul, I if you wanna talk, by all means. Not a question, just basically for everybody out there probably knows that it's the main way that the FCDC does raise money is through memberships and the county contribution and the city's contribution. So um, that's the main way. There are some other ways probably that I don't know about, but those are the three main ways that the FCDC does raise their money. So uh, I know Paul is going to talk to us on some other stuff. If you want to comment on this, or you want to just wait till later? Uh, I don't think we, we've all went through this several times over the years, I think, so. I think we're all quite aware of what this is all about and how it works, so. It's the amount we agreed to budget during our budget, and um, right. we're happy with the services, especially since you've come on board, we're excited about the future, so. I'd be happy to make a motion to approve the contract. I have a motion for a second. Second. Commissioner Dunn? Yes. Commissioner Stoudemire? Yes. Commissioner Waymeyer? Yes. Commissioner Dickinson? Yes. Chair Howard? Yes. Okay, that's all the items of business. Takes us to staff reports. Derek? Yeah. Um, I mentioned debt a little bit earlier. Something that Janet and I are in the process of looking into. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to bear any fruit or not, but we are looking at potential refinancing options for some of the debt that we do have. Um, we've got a call scheduled with David Artaberry, our financial advisor, to look at that. But we have some reason to believe that if we refinance our bonds, um, you know, we could be looking at several hundred thousand dollars of potential savings and interest over the life of the bond. And so, uh, we will certainly, as we learn more, that'll probably be an item that we study at some point early in 2020, but um, anything we can do to, uh, obviously saving money is important, but if we can, you know, maybe cut some time off of it, and, and it's fairly complicated because all of those bonds are different and when they can be called, and so, but that's something we're looking into. Tax sale. Um, told you it's been filed. There isn't anything going to happen on it the rest of the year, but in January, I would expect it to uh, uh, probably end up on the judge's docket then, and then it'll keep proceeding forward from there. So hopefully, depending on, again, what else the judge has, we're having the actual sale in the first quarter of 20. Um, you will notice some of you have them up there, bags of cookies. Um, Janet, uh, Casey, and I um, decided that we wanted to do something. We talk about it all the time at our department head meetings. We wanted to do something nice for the employees. It's obviously, it's a couple of cookies. It's not a huge gesture. 
but we um, bagged them and hand delivered them all yesterday. And I'm really pleased with the responses that we got. Um, our employees, they, <laughs> they were super grateful for it. And I think it's not much, you know, we can't give cash bonuses, obviously. It wouldn't be responsible for us to give cash bonuses, but think, and doing the little things um, has seemed to be a big deal. So. Uh, appreciate Janet's help, Casey's help. I think it went super well. So that's all I have today. Appreciate it. So, Larry, have anything that? We have uh, some issues that will be coming up with the St. Pablo sewer. We have a portion of that sewer that has now the line has been exposed. in it there was no replacement money in it so uh, it's going to be something that we'll have to bring back to the, the commission in the near future so that we don't uh, jeopardize the, that portion of the system that'd be something to probably do on a study session I think our next opportunity that is January the uh, 6th I believe I think we have a study session that day and I think that's the first thing that we have coming up after this meeting today so okay anything else brandon anything to add well where we've got a uh, <coughs> my department has a 96 jeep cherokee that suffered some vandalism last week um, it was in really rough shape prior to that anyway um, but somebody broke the back window out of it uh, we hadn't even driven it for quite a few months. Um, I plan to put it on Purple Wave and just get rid of it because we have no use for it anymore and it's been damaged anyway. So um, just wanted to let you guys know about that. So, And I asked him to come here and let you know anytime our fleet is going to increase or decrease. I feel like that's something that definitely want you to know um, don't have any intention at this point of replacing it or it's just a, it's a clunker that got vandalized it's an eyesore sitting in the parking lot so I feel like now's the time to, down at the courthouse is that where it's parked yes. yeah you want to tell them about your new snow removal equipment and some oh, of the oh, how did that work <laughs> oh it was like a dream that thing <laughs> That is, uh, has been a humongous help, especially with this heavy snow that we had. Um, made things go a lot quicker. I can't imagine what it would have been like if we didn't have it on this snow. Um, this was uh, a lot of snow and really heavy, wet snow. So uh, yeah, it made things go a lot quicker and um, it's, uh, it's really nice to have it, so. I know it was used um, equipment, but Derek, sent us pictures of it when it when he got it and it looked like it's in uh, pretty pretty good shape yeah fresh coat of paint on it before we got it and yeah so it's a it's a nice machine and the prior owner had put a couple thousand dollars worth of servicing into it before he got rid of it so right. it's yep. i mean it it's in really good shape it what good. It is. we got a spot and i think i sent you a picture of it out at the record center we've got a spot where we can keep it indoors in the garage there so it shouldn't get weathered i mean it we've got a pretty good arrangement there i think yes yeah. and we've also got um the uh, uh sally port and in the jail they've got a uh, hose in there and a drain in the floor so we can just pull it in there after each snow spray it down so we can get all that salt and snow and stuff off of it so we should have uh have that thing around for quite a while well, the next few days in the 50s will probably help you with that snows too, so. Right. <laughs> Do you use the uh, sweeper down there at the courthouse square? We did. We did. It looks good down there. Yeah, yeah. It made quick work of it, and it, it cleans it off really well. Cool. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks. Sheriff? Good morning. I 
kind of want to echo a little bit of what Derek said and say, and express our appreciation for the um, for the thought and the gift uh, to all the employees and it, it was it was uh, received well and uh, very much appreciated. Um, also, I would just want to uh, commend Alan and Derek for the work they did on the uh, on that burn permit issue. That's something that's kind of been there hanging out there for a couple of years now and there was a lot of things a lot of moving parts to that um, from my perspective on an enforcement side um, we fixed the issues that were there to, to allow that but it also focuses on the fact that the real purpose of this was compliance and not enforcement I appreciated the work that that uh, was was put into that so we've been very very busy lately um, don't really have an answer for why um, it's just it's been that way um, but Friday we will have uh, two more deputies graduating the uh, Kansas Law Enforcement Training Center so they'll be graduating the Academy on Friday so uh, it'll be good to get them back here and started in the uh, field training process and uh, so we're, we are looking looking forward to getting those other two people here um, we currently have 69 uh, inmates in the in the jail um, we have one furloughed and nine that are farmed out. Um, a furlough, just so you that all are aware, sometimes a court will order um, that someone be, they're technically in our custody, but they're furloughed out to somewhere else. Typically it is like a drug treatment center or something like that. Um, sometimes they come back to our facility. Other times, if they successfully complete the program they were furloughed to, then the court will release them from there. Um, so, uh, but that's where we're at. We have a total of 79 that are in one way or another in our, in our custody, but 69 of those are in house. Um, part of um, a challenge that jails have as well is that um, we don't want to just be warehousing people, um, which oftentimes is kind of what, what happens with county jails. Um, but we wanted to, we also like to provide some type of programming um, so that we can help at least slow down the revolving door and give people the skills that they need to be successful once they are released. Um, for a couple years now, uh, we have had uh, programming on the female side through uh, Willow Domestic Violence with different programs that they do, and um, that has been very successful. But for the past several months, I've been working with, uh, with that organization to see what we could do for um, our male inmates as well. And this week, um, earlier this week, we started, it uh, was the first session that we had for the male inmates that so they came in and did some, they did their programming. We have some other stuff that's done through our chaplain, um, but this was, an out, was the, the Willow coming in and doing and providing that service. And so um, that was something that we've been working on for a while and it was, it's, it was good to get that in there. I think that we'll see some positive uh, results from that as as well. So, um, if you guys have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Do you have many uh, that's on work release programs down there at the jail? We do not currently have a work release program. Um, I have Derek and I have talked about it briefly. Um, we'll need to get um, some sort of county resolution to be put in place because we can't. I can't find where there has been one approved in the past. Um, the statute requires that we do have a resolution before we can do that. Um, we're already working on the, um, the new policy for that. So we do have the policy part in, in place, um, but before we can truly implement it, we, have to, we need to have the resolution. Um, we have met with Judge Wittemann, and uh, the, so the courts are very interested in having having that type of program as well, and they're very supportive with it. So I, I ex I suspect that when things slow down after the first of the year that we'll, um, that we'll get moving on, that we'll be able to get moving on something like that. But right now, I know that we're both <laughs> very busy and, and so it's on our radar. We just haven't, haven't nailed it down yet. We used to have inmates help with work around the county, like picking up litter at the landfill. Is there any interest in doing that? That's, um, as far as work release? Well, I guess, it, I don't know if it, be work release if it's I mean they're not released they're still in our yes because the work release would be there's rules in place um, that person would have to be employed before they come before they're sentenced to jail and then they would be released 
during their work day to go there. And there's a lot of other nuances to that. Um, what you're talking about is more like an inmate worker yeah. program. I know we've discussed that before. Um, right now, we're very limited on when we do that. Um, we do have inmate workers that work um, in our facility and over at the district court uh, occasionally to do some things. What you're talking about with the uh, out with the landfill and, and things like that, we have done that a couple times, um, but our staffing doesn't always permit it. And um, we have, but we have done that. Obviously, it's a volunteer. They have to volunteer for it, and um, you know, they're not always. Uh, we don't have anything in place that would allow it to offset fines or anything like that. But I do think that that's something that we should be looking at in, in the in the future. Just, to, I think it would benefit the county as well as the inmates. So yes, sir. Uh, sure, sure, Twenty uh, years ago, we had. We had the program out at recycling. I don't know what conspired, what happened, but it did go away. But they did used to have the, a few uh, inmates that did work out at the recycling. So what's the policy when uh, when somebody hits a deer? What what do you do with the deer? What, what's the protocol for that? We have a list of people um, that will come in and recover the deer to harvest it we have what's called a salvage tag so that they are issued a deer tag so it's all tracked um, with the state and everything that way um, and we we just have have a list i will tell you that um, we we're finding right uh, is fewer people are wanting those depending on the damage to that is done to the deer sometimes it's it's not worth their worth their time and then there's a lot of disease um, that's running around out there in the population because it's we're we're much overpopulated in, in the deer in, in this area. So those are some of the hazards that come with that. It's like they're all does because all the horns are gone <laughs> very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sheriff. Nick. I just want to echo what Jeff said about the uh, the cookies. I know I want to thank Derek, Janet, and you guys for doing that. It's it's kind of funny how little things like that do make our employees feel appreciated, and I think it's been nice to see the trend where we are doing more things to maybe recognize our most valuable assets. So thank you for what you guys did with that. They did appreciate it a lot, and it was kind of fun this morning seeing them come in and get them and getting all excited about it. So thank you guys for that. Thanks, Nick. David? All right. Uh, just to echo what uh, talked a second about uh, the inmates and that sort of thing, we do, uh, we do have uh, folks that come and serve community service at the Recycle Center. That happens on a fairly regular basis. Um, so we are, we are doing that much at least, and we can certainly – Continue to talk about opportunities to um, uh, utilize inmates if they're able and willing. Um, so it snowed uh, for the first time this this season. Uh, we started uh, first crews uh, arrived on site at 10 o'clock Sunday morning, uh, and we had folks working continuously until about 6 o'clock Monday night. Uh, we ran a, a day shift, a night shift, and another day shift. Uh, and then we ran a long day yesterday also uh, with our uh, plow trucks and spreaders on, on, the, um, on all of our um, uh, primary uh, roads, all the asphalt roads. Um, and then, of course, we're out today uh, working on that as well. Uh, as a reminder, we have five end dumps that, uh, that have plows and spreaders that, that we utilize. Uh, each one of those trucks is responsible for approximately 40 miles of uh, uh, roadway, uh, and they can treat, they can spread material on six to eight miles of that before they have to come back to the shop, reload, and go back out. Um, and, and it takes, depending on the, the type of snow, the amount of snow, lots of other factors, it may take us a whole uh, shift to cover those 40 miles. 
so we, um, again, we're out starting at 10 and work continuously till six o'clock Monday night. And then we finally sent uh, everybody home and started fresh again on Tuesday. Um, we utilize the noxious weed staff. They've got some smaller trucks with uh, uh, plows and, and we've got one spreader. Uh, we utilize those uh, just as much as we did our, our plow trucks. Uh, they took care of all of our subdivisions, uh, also uh, took care of the sheriff's parking lot, <coughs> uh, the annex, and the um, uh, EMS station there near the hospital. <coughs> So we keep as many of our vehicles going as we can. Um, uh, as for the secondary roads, um, we had several blade operators start uh, Sunday evening, um, and everybody was on the road by uh, about four o'clock Monday morning. And all of those folks uh, worked uh, well into Monday night. Um, and with the, the, the nine blades, uh, we actually were able to put uh, two additional ones. We've got our old John Deere uh, uh, motor grader that we keep for various uh, things. We had it out. We're also testing a uh, blade for Foley equipment, so that was out. So we had 11 blades operating uh, uh, anywhere from 16 to 18, 20 hours uh, almost continuously through that first, uh, first push of the snow. Uh, it generally takes our blade operator operators about 24 hours to get around to all their roads in their district uh, after the snow quits falling. Uh, as you know, this, this snowfall came in two, two chunks. Uh, so they, uh, some of the roads that we had already uh, been down, once the snow continued Monday afternoon, it looked like we hadn't been there, but uh, we had indeed. And, and so those, uh, those guys, Worked a lot of hours to uh, to get that done as well, uh, and they were back out uh, before six o'clock yesterday morning, and they're back out again today, uh, trying to get those uh, last little bits taken care of. So hopefully the weather, uh, uh, sunshine, and and uh, well, sunshine makes a huge difference on the on the ability of our roads to recover and utilize the material that we've put down. Uh, so we've been busy taking care of that. Uh, we were able to help the city of Princeton, uh, as busy as our mechanics are keeping the fleet going. Um, we got a call from the city of Princeton. Their plow truck uh, had some issues with their plow. Uh, we had them bring it to our shop, and uh, um, our, our mechanics spent a couple hours kind of finding some parts and doing a little welding, and we got them back up and running. So they're, they were able to get back out uh, uh, yesterday afternoon and continue taking care of their streets. So we try to do those things for the communities uh, as often as we can. So right now we're, uh, we're wrapping up the snow event and it'll take us a day or two to, to uh, kind of get back to normal operation. So that's, that's obviously been our focus here lately. I'm sure that uh, they're aware of it, Jeff, them, but we are blade in Richmond, right? Yes, just, just the main drag. Anything else? No, sir. Yeah. Oh. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I want to first, before I get into my report, I want to say thanks uh, to you and for the citizens of the county for the funding that, that you've just approved and that FCDC receives. Uh, I want you and the community to know I take that fiduciary responsibility very seriously and uh, we'll make sure that we spend those dollars prudently and effectively, but I, I do deeply appreciate your support and the support of our community. I also want to lift up a, an appreciation from an economic development standpoint for David's folks and the city folks that have cleaned the roads and kept the, the battle on against the snow. That's an important economic development issue as far as having those roads and, and uh, those, those folks worked awful hard and uh, I'm sure that's not always the most safe job so I do deeply appreciate the work that they do. Um, FCDC um, is responsible because of the funding and your support and just I think it's something we should do is to report to you on a regular basis what we're up to and give you a chance to ask me questions. Um, my 
my plan is that I, I'll give an update to uh, Derek in, you know, on a monthly basis and then hopefully be able to come before you on a quarterly basis and give you a chance to visit. Of course, you can always reach out to me in between. I've been able to sit down with two of the five of you so far and working to sit down with the rest of you, but the holiday schedule gets pretty busy. But it's important for me uh, to have that time with you to get your insight and your thoughts as representatives of the people what we can do, what we're not doing, and how we can do a better job. So I look forward to visiting with, with all of you as time permits. Um, industrial development, the uh, proximity park, um, right now we have two, as of yesterday, we got another inquiry. So we've got two active inquiries uh, on, in, on uh, proximity park as we speak. Uh, I'll have a response to them on this latest inquiry uh, tomorrow. And we've, we're on round two on the first inquiry. Uh, I wish I could give you details and information that's more robust on those things, but the businesses that are looking like to be very private and quiet, and they don't want us to share too much too early. But I want you to know that we are having activity on Proximity Park. And discussions I've had with other economic development directors, with the Commerce Department and our broker, friends up in Kansas City um, to, to a person, they have said, we are very fortunate that you and the city uh, took the position of building and fixing proximity parking, making it available. Otherwise, we would not be getting these inquiries. And in fact, our timing as things come online is very good in the sense that the inventory has dipped a little bit in our region. So we're kind of primed because we have tremendous assets there for people. and. An, uh, I look forward to coming to you, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, with great news on a on an industry that's decided to land here. So we're certainly working toward that endeavor. I've also been, um, and I'll touch on this a little bit uh, more, but I've been up and uh, getting more familiar with the Wellsville Industrial Park, and seeing how we can better tie in with that community and support their growth. Obviously, there's a tremendous opportunity in Wellsville, just as there is here in Ottawa, and. Uh, so I think uh, we can do some good things to support Wellsville that maybe we haven't been able to do in the last few months because we didn't have a director. So I'm, I met with the mayor there a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to agree to have some group meetings and do some strategic planning with Wellsville. So I look forward to that. Um, I have been reviewing, as Derek alluded to, the budget uh, very intensely. Again, I do take that incredibly serious. Some of that's my banking background. Uh, I can go numbers crazy, but... I do feel it's important to keep keep tabs on how we're spending it, what's the good use of it. We do need to look at how we're going to market a little more aggressively. We haven't done much in that in the last year again because there wasn't somebody in this position. And so we'll be dedicating some resources to that. But part of that, too, is I'm here so I can do the marketing. So it's not just going out and buying things and doing that. Some of it's you know shoe leather work, which I found in my experience to be some of the best way to to get things done. So build those relationships, build those networks, and we certainly have a lot of positive uh, things to sell. But I am reallocating in, in such how we how we might spend some money. Another important area for me that I want to want to put some funding behind is what are we doing for our current businesses? How are we being a proactive partner for those that have already invested here, already providing jobs, already paying taxes? Um, I think that's where we've fallen short in the past is supporting and being a proactive uh, partner with our current business, our current industry. And so we're working on that on a number of fronts. One of them is workforce development. I've had several meetings with Dr. Cobbs. I've had a, a terrific meeting with the president in Neosho County. And uh, I have my second meeting uh, scheduled right after this meeting with Dr. Wanika at Ottawa University as we're starting to formulate strategies uh, more proactively uh, on workforce development. Uh, Dr. Cobbs is hosting a group of 12 superintendents from the region, not just Franklin County, but from the region early January, and we're gonna sit down with them and talk about um, some regional approaches to workforce development. And then what we'll follow that up with is I'm gonna be reaching out to some of our industry <coughs> and pull them into a meeting with education, say, what is it you need? How can we best coordinate? How can we best connect? And so to get those two audiences and really start to, to build some programming. We're also looking at one-offs as I have inter in interviews and discussions with business leaders and find out, well, I could use soft skill training for maybe just five folks, or I need some uh, trade skill updates or 
maybe some certification updates uh, for eight people. And those are certainly things that we can accommodate on a one-off basis through our partnerships with the high school in Neosho County. So we've got some great educational partners that are willing to participate and support us. And so I'm working hard to build those bridges. Uh, I have been pretty busy since I since I came on board November 4th. I'm starting my sixth week, and I'm got to tell you, I'm just loving it. It's, it's been a, a, a thrill and an honor to do this work. Uh, I've had 32, and when I wrote this, I've had 32 contacts. I've had probably 10 more since then, but um, I've met with folks in Richmond and Wellsville and throughout Ottawa. Um, as I've said, I've, I'm, I'm working and meeting with each of you individually. I'm doing the same thing with the city council and other leaders within the community. Um, I've been to various service clubs. Uh, if you want to come hear me at the Breakfast Optimus tomorrow at 6.30, I'll be there. Um, don't know how awake I'll be, but I'll be there. Um, but I am looking forward uh, to those types of outreach to let them know about what FCDC is doing and, and also asking how can we be a better partner and what can we do uh, for those folks that, it, that we represent. Um, so I've, I've been out on the road quite a bit in the, in the region. I've also been in, uh, met several times with folks up in Kansas City with our KCADC partners who uh, provide us a lot of leads on Proximity Park. I've also had multiple meetings with folks from the Commerce Department. Uh, I've been over to Miami County and met with their uh, development director and kind of learned a little bit over there. I was down in Emporia meeting with their economic development director this week and, and got a tour of their industrial park and kind of got some ideas of what they're doing and, and uh, compared notes, so that was, that was very helpful. Last thing I'll speak to is the marketing, which again, um, I feel like I'm a piece of that by getting out and doing the things I'm doing, but also we need to be uh, active in social media uh, we need to be active in the in the out media outlets. I've been on the radio a couple times already. Um, for example, um, when the uh, announcement came from Topeka that Walmart was putting in a new distribution center, um, I saw the social media light up. The, the, I think it was a Wednesday <coughs> night when that came out, so I knew Thursday morning I'd want to get some more answers and get out uh, what was happening there. And um, it. As I suspected, it's it's a totally different niche that that facility is filling. That's for their e-commerce business, where our Walmart is for brick and mortar, and so it's a different supply chain. It's a different network. Now, could it have some ripple effects on workforce? Maybe depends on if the pay scales are much different or not. But I doubt that. But I don't know. Um, but uh, I want to assure people that the plan isn't that Walmart's going to close this one and open a bigger one in Topeka. That's not the plan. Um, and I do have a meeting with the uh, plant manager out here at the distribution center right after the holidays. So if I hear differently, I'll let you know, but I don't think that's the case. Um, we hope to, I uh, keep hoping, but I hope this week our Facebook or our, our web page will be up. Um, it was down when I came on board, our domain had expired, and so we've been doing some reworking and getting that reconnected. Uh, I've been posting on our Facebook page. Um, and we'll even end up being on Twitter. Uh, there's some audiences that appeals to. I'm not one of them, but I will be on Twitter um, just so that we're getting our word out. The other thing I'm going to do is a, a, a regular communication piece that will uh, be in every other week, email blast to members and leaders, um, and it'll be on topic, and it'll circle back through. So the first topic is going to be on workforce development, and that'll be an update from Dr. Cobbs after we meet with the regional superintendents as to what we're doing relative to workforce development. The next one will be something from government, so at some point I'll ask for uh, an update from Franklin County. But the first piece is going to be from the Commerce Department, and so I've got a gentleman there that's going to do an information piece that we'll send out. Two weeks later uh, in the cycle, then I'm going to do a membership, a member feature. So I want to lift up our current business and let people know what they do and where they are and who they are. And so we'll do a member feature uh, that'll go out and that'll also be released to the radio and the paper and those types of things and on social media. And then the other, in the next two week cycle will be an update for me as to what I what I see and what I see coming or not coming and what I've been working on. And then we'll start the cycle over again and be workforce and there'll be another another resource so really trying to up the communication out and I hope 
and what I'm leaving with uh, the businesses I'm visiting with is I hope when they think, I wonder if, if uh, FCDC could help us with that, will come to their mind whenever they have a question and something that we might be able to assist with so that encourage them to pick up the phone and call me and say, hey, can you guys help me with this? Because I want us to be seen more as a, a truly an active partner of the current business as well as trying to recruit new industry. So that's my report. And if you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to address them things <clears throat> that I want to add when we interviewed Paul um, he told us that he was going to get the entire county involved that he was going to visit these small towns um, and we've heard that before from other directors um, and I will tell you I've seen it with my own two eyes multiple times this position gets pressure to focus on one area um, but Paul said he wasn't going to do that, and to his credit, he has not. He has been to Richmond. He has been to Wellsville. And, and I, don't, I don't want us to take that for granted. That is huge for this organization because there are multiple areas of growth in this county. Wellsville is just a fantastic example of that. You know, Richmond obviously doesn't grow at the same pace, but it does grow. Drive down 59, you can see that. And for these small towns to feel like they have a resource um, is just huge for them because they, you know, you look at us, we're a small government. I mean, relatively speaking, we're a small government. Look at Richmond, Kansas. I mean, by comparison, they just, they don't have the resources. And so, to have someone like Paul, um, and you all have done the same. You know, you committed, Janet, step in, but I think it was seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars to Stafford Road up in Wellsville. I mean, that's that's great for them, and so I hope this is kind of a start of a period or an era, I guess, where we do work with the small towns and help them get the resources that they need because we've heard a lot of lip service about that, but I don't know that it's, I've seen it much in my five years here. So I'm glad to see that that's changing. Appreciate Paul taking that effort. But. Paul, when you get inquiries for Proximity Park, are those, are those coming from a bigger outfit? like? The Commerce Department, or, or yeah, they'll like that. they'll, uh, they'll screen uh, them? predominantly they'll come from uh, the Commerce Department or KCADC, which is an organization we're a member of that, that represents the Kansas City region, and they're a funnel and a resource that that site selectors go to, and say, hey, who, what do you have in your region, and so they will uh, work with us, and normally uh, those are the two main ways we get that information. Um, every now and then we may get a call from a from a smaller business and just directly saying hey we're thinking about doing something or we, um, what would you what would you be able to do but if it's a major industry it's normally going to come through commerce or through a brokerage company mm -hmm. and so we pay memberships for example the KCA DC we're a member we pay for that service uh, commerce obviously it's a little different dynamic but they're uh, commerce is tremendously supportive of what we're what we're trying to do. You pick up the phone and get help instantly. It's it's fantastic. All right. Thank you. Next is Commissioner Comments and Board Reports. Roy. Well, this is our last meeting of the year, and I just want to wish our employees and everybody out there uh, happy holidays and happy new year. I do appreciate my employees at Franklin County, but we are not going to take credit for this. I was just as excited as everybody else that I had cookies. I don't have to steal my husband's. That's awesome. <laughs> um, the only thing that I went to in the last uh, week was I went to the Chamber Coffee uh, at the Ottawa Library where they announced the new uh, O-Town Read for 2020. They, they kind of went a different direction this year. It's a book by Matt Beasler, who plays for KC Sporting. Um, it's inspirational stories and um, anyway they tried to maybe reach a maybe a little bit different audience and something cool about this is Matt Beasler is actually going to be in Ottawa in January so um, go down to the library and get a copy of the book um, become a part of O-Town Reads for 2020 cool appreciate our administrative team and the gesture <laughs> 
that they put together for the employees. I think it shows good leadership. I um, appreciate Alan also, I think, for the second time. Um, this time with the burn bands and before with the radios, he took a complicated issue, uh, thoroughly vetted it, all the things that, I mean, what we see here uh, be the tip of the iceberg as far as the complicated, complicated issues he's dealt with, built a consensus, uh, done outreach uh, to the community and all the pertinent people uh, involved, and um, the end result was a good policy both times. So not an easy thing to do, an important thing to do. And <clears throat> when it works well, you don't really think about it, so. Uh, yeah, 10 last Thursday in this room, we had the uh, Lake Region Solid Waste Authority, very well attended. Uh, David and myself and Peg was here to represent Franklin County. Uh, we did have a, uh, Charlene Weiss is our coordinator and she announced that she will be stepping down for the second time she's been a coordinator for us. Um, won't get health problems and other things, but she not stepping away totally. She still will be going to come back as a Miami County representative on the board. So whoever uh, we do eventually hire will have somebody on the board that's been the coordinator and, and it'll be maybe take a lot of the pressure off of them being the coordinator, but you'll have somebody that can be right there to help them uh, figure out anything they need to figure out as uh, J.R. McMahon, our chairman, will be putting out a uh, job description and, and so forth, and he'll be con contacting HR departments in each, each one of the six counties that are involved. So we'll be able to put it out on our website also, the advertisement of. And uh, uh, we had a lady there from Lake Mary, Miami County, that uh, we helped sponsor a uh, recycling grant that they had, and they was able to get $25,000 recycling grant. And we did find out in our conversation, really they're bigger, they have 400 employees. They're the third largest employer in Miami County. We, I didn't realize that. <clears throat> but anyhow, they have a separate recycling program over there, and we found out during the program that uh, but, uh, we may be able to they have a small electronics recycling program over there that we'd be able to get rid of our small electronics, which we don't have an outlet. In fact, we're paying to have to get rid of it now. And now we may have a contact. We may be able to uh, uh, take a truckload at a time over there and, uh, and get rid of them. We're working the logistics out without, I know Peg and Dave are working with them, and, and we're all hoping that'll uh, bring some savings to each one of our counties and help solve a little bit of a problem. Uh, and then the other one that we talked about, we helped uh, Lynn County sponsor them and they got a $40,000 recycling grant down there. And uh, what is the exact title that Charlene got appointed to at the state level? It's, it's, it's a branch of the KDHE and then on the recycling. Yeah, I, I forget exactly what it is, but all of the grants that uh, they go through related to this, uh, that committee will review those and make their recommendations. So it's a, it's a fairly big deal, and, and to have we'll actually have two folks from our region that sit on that board, so that's a, that's a positive thing for this, this whole six-county area. Right, and maybe that's a little of it. Or that she, she'll have more flexibility now on that board to approve grants, probably maybe she didn't figure she ought to be the coordinator, our coordinator, and approve a grant that we that she actually applies for. So, uh, but anyhow, I think it'd be a good op a good opportunity for someone that uh, uh, either retired or uh, just looking for. Uh, uh, they, I can see them work even somebody with a full time job working this into their position uh, and make it. You know, actually, a lot of people could make it work in there. So, and we've been lucky to have three or four good coordinators, and uh, and over the last ten years, and they all went on to bigger and better things. Uh, everything's always been a good passing when they when they have left as a coordinator, either left the state or took a bigger job somewhere. Or, so, uh, uh, I feel like it'd be a good opportunity for someone uh, to. Uh, uh, be a part of a six-county organization, 
and uh, not spend, it's about 20 hours a week, but a lot of those hours can be served in your own home, doing uh, paperwork and book work and applying for grants and so forth. So it's something you could do in the evenings and the mornings and the weekends. And uh, so we meet once every three months. That'd be the only one day they'd really actually be locked into daytime. Uh, so I think when it does come out, uh, I advise anybody that has a, don't let it stand in your way if you have a full-time job that I think maybe you could possibly make it work if you move a few things around. So that's all I got. I forgot, and I was going to add, we stayed at our house in home at, at Sunday. On Monday, my husband got out, and the uh, county road definitely had, our road had been taken care of. Uh, the highway was great. No road issues at all. That's why you got into the city of Ottawa. So kudos to the county uh, for getting out and taking care of the roads. When's our next meeting? Sixth. Sixth. Yeah. We're doing a study session. If, I guess that's the where the pattern falls. If we were to kind of stutter step, move that to the 13th or just start going off the 13th, we would miss Martin Luther King Day, President's Day, which doesn't matter, Easter, and Memorial Day. All of those are on Mondays. That's just the first four or five months. But if we leave it on this pattern, we'll hit every single, all those holidays. Gotcha. So. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think those are the types of things we normally talk about at our reorganization meeting, but When's, I think it's a great idea. Okay, just put that on the radar. When's when, our reorg meeting? When is that? Do we know? And we're the 13th of reorganization meeting. Well, that's what perfect. Yeah. If we, we'll let Derek and I review that, and then we'll we'll get it. Might not be a bad idea. Let's go ahead and have a regular meeting on the Wednesday before, and then do the reorganization on Monday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. So um, we can look at that. But yeah, we provided we don't find anything what I might do is just send all of you if you're okay with it Rick just send all of you a note saying let's instead of meeting on the 6th let's just wait till the 8th and then we'll pick up our study sessions on the 13th and go from there so all right yeah makes sense okay I haven't attended anything since our last meeting I agree I want to thank Janet Tammy and Derek for baking cookies for us <laughs> appreciate that and uh, I just want to chime in on what uh, Colton said I agree that uh, I think that our burn permit thing showed what a study session and should how it should work we had a good discussion a lot of questions came up Alan went out they addressed the questions and put together a, a good product so I think that worked the way the study sessions are intended to work and we got what we needed to do done so anyway, we're just discussed. We have no more meetings this month or this year, and we'll wait to hear from you about how we're going to do that on the 6th or the 13th. Um, with that, I would look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to okay. a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned. <laughs>